So, uh, wow, this is pretty amazing. <laughs> this is pretty amazing. <laughs> Give me a second. Here. I'm a little taken aback by everything, but uh, I'd, I'd love to thank so many people so much. Uh, most prominently, my uh, my chapter over here, my school, as well as the state of Texas and all the people who I got to compete against. So yeah, go to Texas. And then on top of that, all the other great people I got to meet while I was here. It was such an amazing journey. I'm, this is actually a, my first year, and I, I found my passion here. <laughs> it really is amazing. Thank you so much. So uh, I had my TED Talk ready here, if we're uh, ready to get started with that. Is everyone ready? Yeah. Awesome. Great crowd, great crowd. So, without any further ado, welcome everybody. My name is Ryan Nathaniel Kintz and I represent Southwest High School in San Antonio, Texas. Yeah, I'm just gonna stop there, that's it. That, goodbye everybody. And uh, I'd love to thank you all so much for being here. I love the support and it's really an amazing thing to be able to give a TED Talk in front of all these people. So let's get right on with the show, I don't mean. Let's start off with a story. A man by the name of Mark Brackett of Yale University, he is the department, he is the head of the Department of Psychology as well as the head director of the Yale Center for Emotional Intelligence. So he's a very accomplished man in his field, as you can tell. Him and Lady Gaga's Born This Way Foundation one day got in ties with one another and said, hey, let's throw some money in an envelope and send out a survey to 22,000 high school students from around the US. Unfortunately, <laughs> The results of said survey were mostly negative. The head question in the survey was, how are kids feeling in school? How are you feeling in school? 39% said tired, 29% said stressed, and 26% said bored. These statistics were totally unbiased of gender as well as the location they were given in. On the contrary, two out of every 10 responses were positive but not merely positive, but rather positive mixed in with neutrality, it's sort of diluted. And 22% of the positive to neutral responses responded with happy, and only 4.7% out of two out of every 10 responses was excited. Ouch. Two out of every 10 already, that ratio is pretty low, and then 4.7% of that on top of that. Obviously, students aren't very happy in school, the great majority of them. Why is this? Why? It's the big kicker, right? That's the question. Well, let's start off one by one and piece this together. Meet Dr. Mary Karskadon. She is a chronologist at, uh, and professor at the Department of Psychiatry and Human Behavior at Brown University. She runs her own lab and that sort of thing. Uh, it's a sleep lab. Chronology is the study of sleep. So she decided to take a bunch of high schoolers into her lab and figure out, survey them, take uh, sleep pattern studies and all this and find out why high school students feel so tired in school. What the test concluded is that America was originally based off an agrarian society, sorry, and an economy to follow, that students had to be home in the afternoon to be able to help with farm tours and stuff like that. So the schools had to put their times further forward in the day so that these uh, their, their kids could get all their schooling done and then go home, help with farm chores, because this time, American economy was based off of farm labor and such like that. But ladies and gentlemen, we don't live in an agrarian society, an ag agrarian society, I keep saying agrarian, um, where we live in a society full of jet planes, Wi-Fi, and rocket-propelled fish. I mean, why do we have these time constraints? Well, if you want a simple explanation, it's because humans are creatures of habits and we haven't changed it over time. If you want an answer, most scientists agree that after 8.30 in the morning, teenagers are more apt to be able to work better and stuff like that, so school should start at after 8.30 in the morning. Sorry, I was like, moving on. Um, New York Times conducted a study to shed some light on the secrets of why kids feel bored in school. Why do high schoolers feel bored in school? Well, they came up with four main plot points. On the count of three, can I get everyone to say under challenge with me? One, two, three. Under, under challenge. challenge. <laughs> hey, you guys are good at this. So, students are feeling under challenged. We have a lot of GT students in school. And unfortunately, we have a lot of students who should be GT in school as well, but are not labeled GT because our GT program isn't exactly all that refined yet. 
So we have a lot of kids that don't get into the program. And then when they do get into GT, what happens? Um, they're given a couple more standardized tests and sent on a field trip, and then they're thrown back into class with their peers instead of do all the easy work. On the count of three, can everyone say under motivated? One, two, three. Under motivated. So, this isn't always the fault of the school. This could be the fault of the student as well, but this could be a sign of pure laziness. And pure laziness is something that could be a Harvard investor at home and uh, be picked up by the people around them, by around, uh, around these students, of course. And although it's not a problem that the school actually produces all the time, it is a problem that does affect standard schooling. <clears throat> On the count of three, underconnected. One, two, three. Underconnected. So this is a big plot point right here because students, we as students in this time and era, we're all like, it's a stereotype that all of us have cell phones, all of us have internet access, and so we can log on to Canvas or Google Classroom whenever we want and get the work done. It's a very, very common misconception as many inner city students and schools don't exactly have all the resources and technology to provide the kids with online stuff. And online stuff is usually very helpful in school. These kids have to walk miles to the nearest library in already dangerous neighborhoods or be at school already to be able to utilize the resources they have available like the internet. On top of that, teachers in a lot of schools aren't given the proper funding to buy new books. And what happens when you teach out of old books? You teach outdated information from outdated sources and hope that these children can one day use this irrelevant information to fuel their careers. And the very last one, on the count of three, one, two, three. Under Underskilled. Man, that was awesome. I'm sorry, I love it. Underskilled. Has anyone here ever heard the term pity pass? If you have, raise your hand. Pity pass essentially entails that a teacher or a district will pass on a student from one grade to another, even though they haven't completely mastered the contents of a certain course, because they don't want to take the emotional strain of the student being separated from their peers or uh, the child is too much of a bother in the classroom, as if putting a student on top of a curriculum that was based off previous knowledge that they never actually mastered is a good idea. So, last but not least at all, stress. Stress has very many negative connotations whenever we hear the word, and unfortunately, schooling is one of the many things that causes those negative connotations. Stuff like standardized school systems and standardized testing are two very common things we hear that essentially mean everybody gets equal footing or something like that when we hand out paper tests that are only written and not exactly hitting all three points that we usually hear visual, kinesthetic, and audible. Instead, we're only hitting maybe one of those every time we put out a standardized test. So is that fair to the students who rely on their other senses to be able to work. Well, unfortunately, there's many negative downsides to the amount of stress we're getting in school nowadays as well. Scientists theorize that the amount of school, the amount of uh, stress in high school that we're getting now is more than it's ever been ever in the history of schooling and the history of the earth. It's huge. Unfortunately, the, the many downsides of which are moodiness, depression, uh, obesity, everyone's heard of stress eating before, right? Uh, stuff like that, substance abuse, and alcoholism. These students have to turn to these things because of the stress, and it puts them in, in, a, in a place where they're very prone to high-risk behaviors and stuff like that. And spontaneous combustion. If you give your kids too much stress, they'll just explode in class. I've seen it. I'm a doctor. Trust me. <laughs> Scientists do say that there is a very small, controlled, consistent amount of stress that you can give a person to put them in their prime. To, to make a person work very hard and they can work better that way and they think better. And school way overshoots that, way overshoots that. The amount of stress that we get in school as compared to good stress feels a lot like that. And that's a cool stress talk. <laughs> so, what are the solutions to this? I've offered answers to what maybe one of these and no más. What are the solutions to wrap up, to bind up this entire problem? Well, for one, keep, get, get kids connected. This is very hard to do because a lot of times this requires funding, and we don't always have funding. Uh, proper funding management fixes a lot of these things, but 
further up things that we can uh, implement into our classroom that don't require nearly as much funding is student voice. By giving students a voice, you've entertained their stimuli. You're, st you're stimulating these people, these children, not even children at this point, because if they're in high school, they're usually young adults. You're stimulating their ability to pick for themselves, to choose for themselves. And when someone can choose for themselves, they don't feel as bored or anything like that. They, they feel like they have power. And by far, the best theory to end all of this was created by a man by the name of Howard Gardner. Howard Gardner is a very famous uh, psychological developmental guy. A, a lot of teachers and stuff like that know him. And he came up with the idea that there is not three different types of intelligences, kinesthetic, audible, and visual, but rather something along the lines of eight or nine subshells to go around those that have to do with physical and bodily, natural, and uh, musical, and all these things tie in together. And students can hold more of these things, like you can hold them sim simultaneously. And these give a more accurate measurement of how much a student can learn or what a student can learn with. Howard Gardner also made the very famous quote, if everyone learned the same, if every one of us learned the exact same, the school system that we have right now would be a utopian society. We, we, we wouldn't need all this stuff. We wouldn't be here trying to better ourselves because, well, we wouldn't need it. But when we realize that each and every one of us in this room learns differently, speaks differently, thinks differently, talks differently, has a different personality, the school system that treats us all the same, that standardizes everything, is the most unfair and cruel school system you could force upon a child. So, the fruits of his labor. This is a Noda Elementary School in Southern California, known for their program called Smartsville. Smartsville was a program developed off Howard Gardner's theory of multiple intelligences that basically says people can hold many simultaneous uh, different types of intelligences all at once. Well, these students are given these tests at the beginning of their year, and they figure out what kinds of stimulus these kids react to, react best to in that. And then once they're figured out, these students are given their own curriculum. How awesome is that? These students are given a place, a way, a curriculum where they can learn on their own time, their own standards, rather than having to sit in class with everyone else and hope they pick up the information, because not everyone learns the same. And it works. Test scores are among the highest in the nation among elementary schools on a national level, being among the top 85%. It's amazing. So, we come to a point now where we must realize that we need to empower our students. We need to give our teachers better resources, and these resources don't cost all that much. These are resources that can be implemented into everyday, everyday teaching. I, Ryan Nathaniel Kent, no longer represent Southwest High School in San Antonio. I no longer represent the state of Texas in that. I represent every student that will ever come after me. I represent every student that has the ability to learn better than I did. Me being a teacher has the absolute capacity to pick up on things that I never got to because we live in a society where a standardized school system is a standardized school system and if you don't learn, you don't learn. I speak for every child that could have had Superpowers. Woo! I speak as a super student. I am someone who is no longer bound by the confines of time or stress or boredom because there is better things out there for me. There is better ways of learning. There is better ways of picking up things that I never thought imaginable in my time. I speak for every student who has the potential to one day come back to their teachers and say, I've done great things in life because of you. Because you made me an unstandardized, standardized curriculum so that I could do my very best. So that I could be a super student. I could be the best learner that I could be. I could be the best me that I could be. And I thank you so much for harboring this inside of me. I thank you so much for putting these little things inside of me and teaching me the way that I needed to be taught so that I could be something great too. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Ryan Nathaniel Kent.